to today's session. Uh, we are really happy to host this session and this time we are not using YouTube and that's a big step up for us. We are actually uh, doing session on a self-hosted instance of Big Blue Button provided to us by you know, none other than Abbas itself. <laughs> so Abbas, really thanks to you for that. First of all, let me welcome you to our show. We are organizing this as a part of the fourth anniversary of uh, our small community, Student Arab Society. So welcome to the session. Thank you. Glad to be right. here and I really hope to have a interesting discussion with you and I hope it's helpful to everyone who's here today with us. Same, same Abbas. So to start off, uh, you are someone who is uh, who has been doing this for a while, uh, who has been doing the Linux thing, consultancy thing. So right now a lot of things are very easy because like we have good internet in India, we have, you know, a lot of services like uh, tech has become cheaper as time went. So how was it, uh, you know, starting a tech consultancy, more or a Linux consultancy uh, back in the day? So, you know, what I'd like to, the way I like to put it is when you don't know too much, uh, you can be foolish and not know about it. You know, it only hurts others when they see what, how foolish you are or how foolish you've been. Now, I can say that in the hindsight, uh, yeah. but when I was younger, I wouldn't have uh, thought of a lot of things as foolish, right? right, right, right. So, so well, uh, you know, you, like you said, a lot of things are easy today. Uh, things are easy, not just because the access to those things are easy, but also because a lot of those things are technically easy. Right. Right. Uh, so installing a GNU Linux OS was also very complex. Uh, when I was starting out and one of the first things I did when I was uh, installing uh, an OS at that time, I think it was 97, 98, mm -hmm. was that I just ended up deleting the existing disk that I had and I lost all my data. And uh, well, I learned something out of it. It was a huge loss. But what I'm trying to say is that, uh, well, we don't have to fight with graphics card today. We don't have to fight with uh, how do we get drivers for a for a video card or a network card, uh, how do we, we don't have to think too much before choosing what hardware to install or GNU Linux OS on? Right. right. Uh, so things are easy, right? Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, so well, uh, the thing that drove me to discovering uh, GNU Linux was the fact that everything else was easy, and in in that sense. Uh, figuring out what Linux is and how to use free software was an, was an unknown. And it was uh, it was a huge, uh, uh, you know, ocean. You know, you've not seen how deep it is. You don't know what is there in it. But, well, at least it's an unknown. And uh, hence, it must be exciting. And then hence, there must be a lot of things to learn, you know, learn there. So if you, when I look at a student today who is using, say, Windows, uh, you know, the, the point is, you are limiting your learning opportunities greatly by choosing an OS like that. Forget about everything else. If you just optimize for learning, if your only focus was that, how do I create the best learning opportunities for myself, then choosing an OS like that uh, is the opposite of doing that. Right? Right. Uh, let us assume that things sometimes break down when you use, uh, say, Debian. but. Actually, they don't, but let's assume they do. But if they do, then they also give you an opportunity to learn something more, right? Exactly. So, uh, so what drove me to discovering new operating systems was that there was not enough that was uh, breaking down. And there was not much I could do anyways on Windows uh, at that time, uh, Windows 95 or Windows 98. Uh, so, and then I'm glad I stuck to, well, I didn't have to ever go back to, uh, you know, using any other OS after that. Right, right, right. So, so and another question obviously comes down with that. As time went by, you know, so usually, you know, like things used to be difficult back in the day and things are easier now. So you would expect people to, more and more people to come and join our, our side of things. But, you know, you often don't see that. And you, see, you find that a lot of people are, don't even, you know, recognize Linux as a desktop platform, they think it's a server. And a lot of people even fail to see the moral 
you know a factor in this whole scenario and i why do you think uh, why do you think that has come about uh, first of all like as in uh, because we all this came from a sort of hacker culture where people actually cared about morals because uh, right about the start of like the software industry back in 1970s 80s free software movement also started right then because like people cared even from that early on but as time went by as the i think as the industry grew i think things changed so why do you think that is and why do you think and how do you think we as you know sort of activists can sort of bring back the balance okay so again let me share some of my formative experiences and that will help you connect with the hacker culture that you mentioned you know right, maybe right. we'll define what hacker culture is but uh, so think of it today, uh, when we want to learn something, our instinct is to search for it. And uh, most of the times information is very close by. Right. We would sometimes, if, if we can't find something, we ask others about it. And then we might know someone whom we can ask as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is, how, uh, that is how we seek information. That is how we try to learn something or that is how we try to overcome an obstacle. Now, you know, you said things are so much easier today when you use uh, GNU, GNU Linux. Uh, why are people saying, why do people say it's still a very tough thing to use or why is it hard? Well, my my perspective is that as things become easy, you know, so difficulty level goes down, our, you know, collectively somehow our, our ability to figure things out or our, our inclination to figure things out rather, our inclination is also going down. We are becoming lazier, right? right? right, right so right. because everything is available easily, we have grown used to not having to put in that much effort to seek things out. Or we have got used to staying away from something that would drive us to seeking something new out or something unknown out. Uh, you know, or we, maybe we don't want to take a risk. Uh, so I think that is what plagues us. Now, uh, so when when I was in school, uh, we so there was no internet, right? Internet came <clears throat> around ninety five, uh, and uh, so prior to that, how do you talk to people? How do you communicate? How do you discover? How do you download software? How do I so you know? So I got access to internet via a Unix uh, server about in ninety three or ninety four, uh, and then the only way to uh, access internet was via a uh, Unix shell. It was a Unix, uh, I think a, a Solaris or a SCO Unix system. And you had to use links for it. And uh, one of the first utilities, utility of the internet for me was to download tablature for uh, or, or surf news net, use net news groups to, to discover tablature for, for playing guitar songs because they were very good forums uh, uh, where you could go and search for those songs and you could download the tablature and figure out how to play that song on your uh, on your guitar and uh, then you could also read discussion and people would discuss things and so usenet has always been a huge uh, community right before mailing list you had usenet now so before that i mean so so basically there was no internet but there were there was a blooming community of bulletin board systems in that country Every city, almost Bangalore had a BBS at that time. There was one in Delhi, one in Pune, one in Ahmedabad where I was growing up. There was one in Kolkata as well. Uh, there was in Mumbai, yes. So there were all these bulletin board systems and you know they would allow you to dial in over a phone line and uh, exchange messages with people. And you could also get into group chat, multi-user chat. You could sometimes play text games over it if there were everyone, multiple people online at the same time. But that, that would be rare. So the whole point was you connect, you send your messages, you download new messages from all the forums or the sort of echoes that you subscribe to and you disconnect. And then you have another piece of DOS software which you would use to read those messages, right? Now, there were very, so there were, there were, there were uh, discussion groups which were local to your city and there were discussion groups which were mirrored all across the country and there was, they were called Bharat Net Echoes. And then there were groups which were, actually echoed and mirrored across the world. They were called Fedonet, right? So if you post it there, you could actually talk to just about uh, anyone in the world. And th th there used to be a mirror for uh, Usenet as well. So so th what I'm trying to say is that today, uh, uh, that was you know, an earlier precursor to, 
to the internet discussion group. So we have matrix chat rooms today. We have mailing lists. Uh, my personally, when I was in school, I learned the basics of internet or how to communicate, how to quote when replying to a message, uh, how to have healthy discussions, how to learn uh, from others. Uh, I, I personally, I learned a lot of that in those bulletin board systems. And you know, they were these were closed spaces, closed in the sense uh, you know there are say twenty people from a city on that, or forty people, and uh, well, there are doctors, there are engineers, there are all sorts of people there who sh who share a common interest for computing. But that's not what you're discussing there. You're discussing music, you're discussing art, you're discussing books, and you're also discussing electronics and computers, right? So I think that sort of that community was uh, you know amazing. That community was amazing. In fact, a lot of people who, uh, who, who even today are very active in the free software community. I, I remember a lot of them were there uh, in those uh, bulletin board systems as well. They used to operate those systems. In fact, apart from that, there were clubs. So, like we have, uh, you know, we we have we've had uh, new Linux user groups in various cities. We had Linux user groups in various cities earlier. Those Linux users groups played played a very critical role in spreading free software in, in those cities, right? Uh, among students, among professionals, among teachers, among all, all sorts of people. Right. And uh, uh, so, so what, in a way, what bound people to those user groups was two things. One is they're, if they've learned something, they want to share it, they want more people to discover free software and use it. But very importantly, they were places where you could get a problem solved. Mm -hmm. right? So right. if you don't know how to do something or you want to install an OS on your computer, you could actually take your desktop to a community event of that sort. And you can take help to get an OS installed. Or you right. could ask a question about something and you could get an answer from someone within your same city. And you know you might even meet them one day. And you know people got to know each other. And th those, those relationships that people built with each other, those friendships that people built, uh, it helped them do things. It helped them organize events. It helped them uh, find work opportunities. It helped them, you know, hack together on projects. You know, all sorts of things, right? So, 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 lugs were very, uh, very instrumental in how uh, free software spread. But prior to that, uh, you know, I'm talking about early '90s. We had, uh, you know, I think a lot of cities had something called microcomputer users club. Mm -hmm. Which were general, which were general uh, forums to discuss computers, or computer hardware, or, or software, or swap shareware, you know, things like that. So a uh, lot of people were professionals there. Professionals in the sense they were doing computing as a part of the job. Right. A uh, lot of them were young people, you know, maybe 15, 16 year olds like me, oh. who who were just discovering various aspects of computing. Right. And so, but but. They, but then you know there would be meetings where you would learn things from each other, or you would have you know sort of debug sessions. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, these were places where you would form similar relationships, right? Right. Like right. Like, like you build friendships in, in your lugs, you 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 would build very strong relationships in those uh, microcomputer users clubs, and uh, uh, again, like I said, people would uh, come from all walks of life, you know. But they would share an interest in computing, and they would share an interest in sharing knowledge, in helping others, in uh, you know, uh, doing events so that they could talk about what they have done and help others about you know help others discover and do those same things, or or you know so you can see where I'm coming from. Uh, in in a way, what is the hacker culture? You know the the, the word hacker or the hacker culture. One of the main uh, pillars of of that culture is. The f is, is two things mainly. Let, let's to, to start with. One is that I want information to be free, and I want information to be freely available. Right. And I'm I'm really I'm really uh, concerned about that. So I seek avenues to access information and and you know learning like that. But I also seek avenues to share information and learning like that. Right, and right. I want that information and that source code and and that learning to be out there. And I, I know I wanted to help others and not just myself, right? And so in a way, that was what was driving some of these bulletin boards and uh, you, uh, you know computer clubs. 
right right uh, so so uh, actually you know so maybe 10 years after that we had lugs and you know we we've, we've seen how instrumental they were in spreading free software and so many of us discovered uh, free software via some of those uh, lugs uh, when we when we were in college or we were working and you know, we met very interesting people through those uh, community events and uh, things that we did together as a community right, right. so uh, so you know things were difficult and that difficulty of doing things also bound people together right right so it's like all of us have a shared pain <laughs> and uh, in a way that connects us to each other it's not a pain really but uh, it, it is what uh, would get people in, in, in the, in to, to meet up it would get people because they cared about it right. See, everyone who has a pain doesn't always care about it they don't, they don't always care about uh, coming halfway across the city to meet five other people in a coffee shop or, or, or a park or something like that right but if people are willing to put in that effort then that means that they care about those things, right? right they right. care about uh, building a community, or they care about nurturing it, or they care about uh, organizing an event, or or spreading certain uh, uh, skills or, or knowledge, or encouraging others, and you know all, all those sort of things. Right. So, so uh, well, all those things are still there. Uh, you know, we we do have active communities even today. We even we, we have. I mean, so many of us uh, volunteer uh, in our own capacities, some of us uh, a lot more than others. And we, we do do our best to help others out. Uh, I'm not saying that. But I think uh, if, you, if you reflect back to, to how active those communities were earlier, they're not as active today. Right, right. So, so that's a separate problem. You know, we can, we can discuss that separately. But uh, uh, I, in a sense, that culture of being able to connect with people and mm -hmm. being able to have a common ground on the basis of which you make that connection i think that is very critical right, right. that could be that could be a technical thing that could be a uh, you know a ideological thing uh, it could be it could be either of those you know those are i would say two prominent entry points that, that, that totally makes sense because you know personally i don't think that a free software project can exist like healthily without a community around it right and often i think even when people uh, when people people who use linux or free software for the first time the reason they struggle is often because they are not part of any community and they're trying to tackle a lot of problems like on their own and more and uh, the matter of the fact is that today like the installation and using these uh, you know pieces of software become so easy that one can do that without being part of a community but you know often you do not get the full picture if you're not part of a community you do not get the full reasoning as to why you are using that piece of software or what are the values that those software invite in them and it's not just source code and i think and i also feel that free software a good part of the reason why free software and you know GNU Linux succeeded is because people cared about privacy. People cared about the freedom that this uh, software put uh, gave them. Because like when you look at it from a say, you know like a totally pragmatic perspective, like without consulting anything else, people already had Unix. You know, people really didn't have any reason to put their effort into like for for free of course and that's another part like for free into these things and spend their time because when they when they already had a day job so i think the com so i think the communities is what livens the the whole experience i think uh, you cannot use free software like you would use a proprietary software like windows because it is not it, it is not created to exist in such a scenario it is created to be used as a community and it is supposed to be uh, extended and that sort of thing and it comes with that no you get yeah please say thoughts on that okay so well lot of us or in fact most of us who use free software don't necessarily you know use the freedom which is embodied in it mm -hmm. uh, which what yeah. i mean is that uh, uh, for example uh, you know think of it like this uh, let's say we i work with a company uh, and i install a free software based uh, server server for them and that server is very critical to whatever they do uh, yeah, 
Now they know that it is free software. They know that it has shows code in it. Uh, they know that they can actually learn to do everything that I might have done for them. Uh, but maybe they don't do it. Right. So when I say they don't do it, I mean they don't learn. Uh, they don't want to learn the same thing. Uh, maybe they think it's not their focus to learn. Their focus is something else, which is OK, fine. But how do you benefit from the freedom that you get with free software? Right. Unless you are concerned. See, so how will the source code empower you? If you refuse to look at it, right. if you use free software the way you would use proprietary software, then that source code really fails to uh, empower you right true, very true. you can you can totally ignore the community you can totally ignore the source code you can totally ignore all the documentation and you know public bug reports and mailing list archives and you can ignore all of that and you can still use it in isolation right, because right. it's getting the job done exactly, right? exactly. now I, and again like i said uh, you know i might actually uh, tell them about it I might encourage them to learn, and I might offer the offer to teach them as well. Uh, but choosing to learn is their choice, isn't it? Exactly. And if they if they don't make that choice, uh, they are using it the way they would use any proprietary software or service. Yes, uh, but it? even yeah. So, even you know, but like even in that sense, uh, but uh, one point to add to that is that even in that sense, it is better to use free software because like. No, even if you are not looking, looking, yeah. Even if you are not, someone else is looking. I'm not arguing about that. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying that uh, you know, uh, uh, most of us who do use it uh, don't always. Uh, we're not able to. It's like uh, you know, leaving money on the table, <laughs> right? right? So right. Uh, it's there for taking, right? right? But you don't take it. You know, exactly. it's, it's like that. So, so the, the point is. Then the next question is whether uh, everyone should care, mm. right? So mm. if everyone cannot care, then again, it's it's uh, futile to pitch these ideological concepts to them, right? right? Because they're not going to care, and they've decided that they don't want to care. But but at the same time, you know, like you said, uh, they're better off using free software than anything else. That is true, because the day they want to care. <laughs> yeah, they have yeah. access to resources. They have access to help. They might have access to source code. They might have access to someone who understands that source code or can fix it, can extend it, can can make it behave in a different way. They they have those. I mean, that freedom will remain there. Right. right. They might yeah. not use it in the short run. They might not acknowledge it, but it is there. It is exactly. there for taking. You know, like I said, it's 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 up to us what choice we make. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, so you, you know what you, you know what you said earlier that it's difficult to use free software without a community. Uh, that is true in a way. That is definitely true, but it depends what our goal as a person are, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and how important that software or that community is for us and what we do in life, isn't it? Right. Uh, everyone doesn't have the same goals. Everyone doesn't see things the same way. Everyone doesn't share the same set of priorities. Right? Uh, and based on how they see those priorities, which are important to them or their lives, uh, they, they will choose to be a part of communities or not. They will choose. So everyone has an appet you know, appetite to how much risk they can take or how much volunteering they can do or uh, how much they can stick to a, a principle. Uh, we we all have our own appetites, and some of us have a bigger appetite than others. Uh, that's it. Uh, and those who do, uh, you know, you know, you you would uh, sort of know those people, right, uh, right. because uh, then those people go out of their way uh, to facilitate those communities, to make them welcoming, to make them diverse, uh, to to make people feel good to be a part of those places. And to make their participation meaningful. Exactly. Because if their if their participation is not meaningful, then why would someone remain there? Right. So it is not just what I draw from it. So you know, in a way, what sustains a community is not just what we draw from it, but also what we contribute back to it. Right. 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 Uh, but there is always a disparity there. You know, what right. I might draw from the from the entire free software community all my life. Uh, there'll be a huge imbalance in terms of what I might uh, 
contribute back. What I contribute back might be a very small, minuscule thing. Mm -hmm. right? What I draw from it is a lot. It's Im impossible to even you know estimate uh, what it is. Uh, right. So if uh, if I build a business out of helping people use free software, you know, and uh, so then every single rupee that I've earned is earned because of somebody else writing software and releasing it under a free software license. Right, right. Right? And, and then also helping others like me learn about it and encourage me to learn about it so that I might find it viable to make a living out of doing something with it. Right? right. So the imbalance is you know, much greater there because my indebtedness to everyone who has written everything from say bash to grub to you know everything else which we use my indebtedness is huge right right yeah. and which is why i would personally in my in my opinion my belief is that why what gives me the right to make anything that i do proprietary you know i would never want to do that because everything that i use 100 exactly. of what i use today is uh, free software and yeah. i have I yeah, might right. just be a sort of a medium, you know, in terms exactly. of using it and translating its value for others' benefit, you know, or my own benefit. Right. And, and the matter of the fact is that even if people don't realize it or not, like most of the internet runs on free software. And whether they know it or not, everyone here is indebted to free software and the you know work of other people who've done it in the name of freedom and privacy. Yeah, so well, again, like you said, everyone doesn't see things the same way, and uh, right. that, that's an issue. So it, it, it's fun that you know, it, it, it's good that you brought up this whole uh, you know, scenario here. So, like, I want to ask you one question uh, with regards to self hosting and platforms, right? So, like, I think we all agree with the fact that federation is the future and it's the right thing to do, and uh, it is so there is. So at, at that point, you know, there comes a, you know, like two kinds of groups of people, people who want people to be able, like everyone in, in general, folks who are not techies, who, to be able to use the software, to be able to easily onboard into it. And there are other people who want people to take, uh, take hold of their, uh, you know, like rights, take hold, uh, take hold of, take responsibility of these things. So the first group of people, you know, go ahead and they create these in, uh, platforms, right? They create, it's like this route. Say. So they host instances, they host free mail, they host instances of XMPP and Nextcloud and everything. And people won't go into these platforms and they keep using the platforms like they would have used uh, Gmail and stuff. Then there are other people who wouldn't do this and who would provide, who would encourage other people to self-host, who would encourage other people to, you know, take control uh, in the sense. So uh, where would you, uh, pick, you know, put yourself in this spectrum? and? Do you, and another question that I'd like to ask is, would it be really great if we try to make something, a platform for, you know, people in general, like maybe Indians, people here in uh, their small communities can take advantage of? Well, I, I side with this self-hosting, uh, pr mm. the principle of self-hosting. Uh, right. And, and there, are, there are many reasons for it, but mainly I would look at it from two perspectives. Number one, on what basis do you trust a service? Right. 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 Uh, well, well, you might be more likely to trust a community maintained service than that which is maintained by a corporation. Maybe that right. is one way to look at it. Uh, but that also limits uh, what the what the service. I mean, so so you mentioned this route. I mean, there are so many such platforms which provide which are community maintained platforms and which provide these services to uh, you know people like us and they charge a reasonable fee for it sometimes so that they can sustain those platforms or they try to raise money via donations and you know, they have patrons who want to donate because they want those platforms to, to survive and, and be viable uh, but my view is that you know it's finally it boils down to trust and it boils down to how and why you would trust someone right, right, right. let's say you let's say you don't know me you meet me on the street uh, would you trust me? Mm -hmm. And if you do trust me, uh, why would you trust me? And what would you trust me with? Would you give me your home key and say, can you go and just water my plants? Right, Maybe right. you won't do that. Right? Maybe you won't do that. Because you have no reason to trust me. Right? Okay. Uh, uh, so, 
and there is another reason the other reason is that uh, some as someone who offers a service like that you know the responsibility on you is immense exactly. because now you have other people's data with you you know and i feel that's a huge responsibility because you can't be you, you can't do a bad job with somebody else's data you know it's like uh, it's like someone's leaving their their pet with you and you know mm -hmm. they obviously they they love their pet now if you if you did not feed that pet or you were unkind to it uh they wouldn't feel nice about it. or you lost the pet maybe you know so what now so so what i'm going to say is that having other people's data is a huge responsibility right and and not all of us want to have that responsibility or are competent to do well when we are given that responsibility right, right. right. so in my view it makes a lot more sense to self host uh, because well that's the ultimate uh, level of control that you can have right and uh, it is also well uh, you know it, it, you don't have to trust anyone else with your data or with your service mm -hmm. yes i mean you will say everyone will say anyone will say that it's, there's a huge technical challenge there and there is a huge right. skill gap and it's not in everyone's appetite to self host and so on and, and that is very true and we can discuss how to mitigate that risk and, and skill gap and so on uh, I'm, but i'm just sharing what how i look at things so you know i would not want to host in fact uh, personally i would never want to host anything for someone you know though that's a very lucrative and profitable business model right. as well. i would rather help someone self host something right. than host it for them and right, right. become the custodian of their data mm -hmm. i would even if i am maintaining something for them i would still want them to have ownership of it so yeah. so there is there is a very thin line between somebody else so you know who owns your data you own your data yeah, sure, yeah. when your data resides on somebody else's computer mm -hmm. uh, then then who owns it well you still own it but that computer is not in your control Right, right, right. My, my, all I'm trying to say is the way I look at self-hosting is I would want the owner of the data to always have control on the computer which stores and hosts the data as well. Right. Uh, because I would make that a very primary uh, way of looking at ownership. Right, right. But so again i would like to like extend that question and be like so like i can probably self host a few services for myself and probably a few family members but then probably there are others who does not have someone in their lives who can you know probably do that for them or something like that uh, and they probably are not technically in depth or they've never been good at good at, they're not confident about their skills so such people are, at that point are not left with very little options so wouldn't you know so at that point you know like what would you suggest because like again I, it, it is in the context of the early questions that i asked with in terms of platform versus self hosting well you mentioned that the future is federation right right right, right. and the more you host with a few a group of few even if they are very ethical hosting providers that's the opposite of federation in a way now you know but let me to answer your question better let me ask you a simple question do you have an inverter at home yes i do okay uh, how many times have you borrowed power from your neighbor uh, when you say borrowed power from your neighbor um never <laughs> so we are so you are self sufficient with regards to your power backup right 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 now today it's a uh, so it's second nature for us to have an inverter maybe or a ups at home mm -hmm. right uh, there was still a time a very long time back when uh, we didn't have power backup right or thinking about having power backup was not something everyone does or that at least that not something we do maybe maybe that's one way to look at it so i think if so if you look at the complexity of having power backup for yourself for your home you know what is the complexity there well you have to pay someone to give you something to yeah. help you have the backup right yeah, but like 
even there like the installation and even maintenance is handled by someone else right? the only fact that yes i can't yes. is like it, it is in my home but it is in your home yeah it, that is true and that is if true. you did not want the person who installed it to maintain it for you right. you could maintain it yourself or you could get somebody else to maintain it very sure yeah you could do that you yeah. you maybe after let's say two years the battery dies out you could buy a battery from a third person right and these things just work together you know there is no there is no uh, compulsion for you to keep going back to the same person who installed it mm -hmm. right so you so you have a great degree of independence you have an absolute degree of control right and you somehow figure out how you want who you want to work with and how you want to manage it right 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 and more or less it works for you and it works for every one of us right. so can self hosting reach that level well i think that the true test of federation is if each of us might have a matrix synapse server running in our houses and we were all self sufficient with regards to our data storage our communication and our home automation and all those needs so you have a sort of a server on everyone in everyone's house that run all the services that the house needs you know it offers a it offers a storage space it offers communication it offers email it, yeah. it offers uh, video conferencing and um, technically all of us know that you know it's possible to do that but uh, like of course every, yeah, even I, if we know it even if we know it can be done that doesn't mean we will do it right right uh, because well you need to administer it uh, right. but i'm just saying uh, you know today people buy nas boxes proprietary nas boxes you know from yeah. various companies uh they are not necessarily system admins those people who are buying those boxes right, right? Right, right they buy it because they want their storage or their backup or whatever they they going to use it for they want that to be close to them <laughs> and one way of having control on your backups and your storage is being able to see that disk in front of you every day right right right, right. right. so again they have figured it out right and so, how many people run a nas in their house at least a right. few 10 tens of millions of people even in india maybe i mean that makes sense so so i think so would you agree if i say the future of federation is also dependent on how easy it is to deploy and manage these instances for someone who might not be very technically skilled or like say a system a linux system admin of course of course right. and it is just getting easier i mean if you look at platforms like you know host mm -hmm. uh, or the freedom box right. and uh, there is freedom bone i mean there are so many projects like that right. which encourage you to host all the services uh, on a single board computer or a small server in your home it could be a old computer maybe and uh, uh it, i'm i'm sure it will just get easier and or, or maybe it's already easier and no one knows about it but right right so um uh, so the, the an interesting comment came as we were talking about this uh, it's from a friend of so he actually told about you know uh, his isp not letting him host servers in his house and that sort of thing so like as these things come by do you think uh, like government will start regulating all these things like who is able to host what because like uh, in a way government is a part of not the entire government may be, but a significant part of the government is paranoid about all of, all of these things and we can even see it in uh, cryptocurrency where governments are trying to you know like <laughs> get the wrap their heads around cryptocurrency essentially so what do you think that will look like see the reason we think our isps don't allow us to host something right, right. is for two reasons they block traffic Right. and uh, maybe they don't give us a static ip hmm. yeah, yeah that's basically yeah. now there are a lot of uh, ways around it actually uh, there are a lot of not costly ways around it in fact uh, uh, we can discuss that but that's not i i don't think that itself is uh, a challenge uh, we can uh, we can we can solve those problems in a variety of ways there are there are people who can give you a uh, an ip they will lease out an ip to you mm -hmm. uh, and map it to your home ip or okay. a vpn connection for example okay right you know, so you point all your services to that ip 
you mm -hmm. point all your DNS records to that, and all the traffic which lands on that public IP gets forwarded to your local home server or router or whatever mm -hmm. over a VPN connection. Now, what does that have to do with the with the ISP? The ISP is not going to block the VPN. The ISP is right. not going to stop that traffic. They they can't even know that about that traffic. Let's say right. right? Now, yes, you are paying for that IP. If your ISP doesn't give you a static IP, then you are paying for that IP and that facility. But that's a possibility. That, that is. is a real possibility. Yep. Uh, maybe you know we can buy so many IPs and we can run that. It's a very simple service to run. Mm -hmm. uh, we can run it as a community as well. But that can enable so many people to uh, network. Right. Post. And uh, also think of it from the perspective that uh, you don't always need internet. Right. 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 The, the critical thing there is not internet. Right. 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 How does WebRTC work? You know, or how mm -hmm. how does uh, something like sync thing work? You know, you have external right. trackers and there is peer-to-peer -peer traffic and, and so right. on. Right. How does IPFS work? How does peer tube work? Right. Mm -hmm. So so these so there are protocols, there is technology. And right. everything we do with the internet, with a server or with these applications is not internet driven. I'm messaging someone in my house. The, the, that traffic goes to the internet, comes back, mm -hmm. right? And if that entire conversation is based on a proprietary network, uh, well, there are so many things which which are wrong with it, maybe. Right. Right. So, so don't just think about the internet. You know, there is a there is a there is a network. Think of when I say federation. A lot of times, uh, let's say you cut off the internet. Okay. Now there is no internet. Uh, can you is this is this server still going to be useful? Mm -hmm. It might still be useful. It would still be yeah. useful. Yeah. Yeah. What if there was a cable in your apartment building or your neighborhood, which uh, was a LAN connection between all the houses there, right? Yeah. Now, even if there was no internet, you could still communicate with your neighbors or people right. around you. That right. could be over wireless. That could be over a wireless mesh if everyone wanted to participate you know, in that. So, so I'm just trying to say that. Internet is not the point. It's about being able to not depend on somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, so many people uh, they grow their own food, mm -hmm. and they don't do that because they want to sell it, or they don't want to. It's not that they don't want to depend on someone else and and so on, right. but they would like a certain degree of independence, uh, and, and they, they would, would want, want to do, do that, that in a sustainable, sustainable manner. manner. Right, right. Right. They're, they're trying to live sustainably. Right. Uh, so, so, so many people grow their food today. Uh, right. can, so, I'm just trying to say this is this is similar to that. Uh, when when people think that they don't want to use a car which runs on fossil fuels, they're taking a very critical ethical decision. Exactly. Yep. It's not just the economics of it, or or how right. it will look, and so on. Right. Right. Uh, right. It, or it might be, but there is there is also a very critical, uh, you know, ideological or ethical decision there, and right. they are able to make that. Right? People walk. Right. Right. So right. people are able to make those choices. I'm just trying to say, we we have to normalize the fact that such choices can be made. Mm -hmm. it, it might seem very odd and unusual at first. Right. right? When I started Deep Root, it was. It was unusual at that time to do what I was trying to do, what you know our very young team was trying to achieve, and everyone said you you are doing it in the wrong place. You should not be in India doing it, or you know who cares about free software and so on. Right. <laughs> uh, but you know, like I said, we were foolish, so we didn't care about what people said. But uh, similarly, when you normalize doing something, and it doesn't remain a very unusual thing to do, like using a GNU Linux OS is not very unusual today. <laughs> right, uh, it's not unusual to know how to administer a system. Maybe, right. right? It's not unusual that people know about Matrix or Nextcloud. So I'm just saying, uh, when you when you normalize things and, and people don't think it is odd anymore, they will make those choices. Uh, I'm sure that makes a lot of sense. Yep, like especially like I know a lot of people who have never left like a certain geographical area in their entire life. So such people like such networks might actually be just what they need because you know I, except 
uh, except like will they take a long trip once a year but apart from that they all stay in that probably a place where a network would be just enough so that actually makes sense and you know like i actually really like the idea of lopi communities coming together and forming such networks and taking care of their own needs like that and i think i've uh, i've heard of stories of communities creating their own isps so so as to you know get access to internet where other companies refuse to give them access because of their geographical location so i think such stories are coming up and, and the more and more you know like people <coughs> so come together and do such things the more and more as you said it will be normalized so i think that is a great step uh, you know like uh, that we can take that we can actually you know try and do as we are of right now now uh, then moving forward again uh, to the actual you know entrepreneur stuff uh, about this whole thing uh, so uh, you actually have worked with governments you've actually worked with schools many uh, many different kinds of institutions so how was the so you you might so like not a lot of people might get the idea of free software and you know some people may so like they probably came to you because you know like there was a financial factor in it and they were not able to buy large licenses uh, so how, so was it uh, was it so at, at any point was it difficult for you to make them understand the idea of you know code that anyone could watch code that anyone could uh, you know like contribute back to so how was that experience see, see think of it like this uh, no one really cares about those <laughs> You know, that's true, that's true. why why do you go to the marketplace you want right, to problem solve right and you don't go to the marketplace with the expectation that someone will do it free of charge for you right, right very right. few people would do that especially if they are businesses right they might have a notion of what they want to pay for it or how they want to pay for it but very few of us would have that sense of entitlement that i deserve to get it Right. And I deserve to get it without having to pay for it in any way. We don't think like that. Right. Most of us, we don't think like that. So when someone has a problem and they want that problem solved, mm -hmm. uh, they also, I mean, they will evaluate their choices, right? I, right. I want ERP in my manufacturing unit. What are my choices? Right, right, right. You will, you will ask yourself that question. Or if I mm -hmm. want a mail server, what are my choices? If I want to share my internet in my office, what are my choices? Right. right. So, so when you ask that question, you will look for answers. Now, where will you look for answers? You might search on the internet. You might go and visit a trade show. You might ask someone else who's just, whose opinion you respect. You might uh, look at a magazine. You might look at ads in the newspaper. You might go to a mailing list. You might go to a forum uh, or, or a social, social network, network today. today. Right. So you do all these things. And you get opinions from people, you get their advice, you get their referrals, and then you finally the decision has to be yours, right? That I mean, most most of the time the decision is going to be yours. So in my, so my way of looking at business is that you know when people want the problem solved, they are going to evaluate multiple people who can possibly solve that problem. How they choose that one person who does solve it. I mean, there is no one way to predict that. It's not always a reasonable or a rational decision. They might just like that person, or they might just uh, like uh, what they are, what the dream they are selling to them, or they might. So, uh, I mean, there are so many factors there, right? And some people, like I said earlier, have a greater appetite for risk than others, right? So, uh, at a time when no one is choosing free software. Uh, if someone does choose free software, it could be not just that they understand what free software is, but it could also be that you know they are ready to take a risk. It's not that there is there is no downside to that risk, but somehow they have the confidence that they can take that risk, right? right. So you know when so whenever you're, you're trying to do something uh, different like that, uh, you're going to meet those people who will believe in you. Right, uh, because at a they have the ability to take risks, and they are the sort of people who like to try out something new, or right. they disco discover it, and they have a problem to be solved. You know, so just because I like a solution and I don't have a problem, I'm not going to buy that solution. Right, right, right. So right. both those things have to happen at the same time. Right. Uh, so, so they will uh, want to do business with you. 
And when they want to do business with you, the, one of the first things uh, that they will look at is your, your ability, ability to solve, solve the problem, problem isn't it? it? That's, That's what we discussed earlier. Right. Uh, and, and then, then they, they will also look at how you're going to solve it. What are the you know the boundaries of how you want to solve it? You know the ideology or the the philosophy. Th those things will come in. They will come into the way you maybe interact with them or the, the way you do your work. You know the way you carry yourself and so on. Uh, maybe they don't uh, matter initially, but eventually they do. So I'm just trying to say everyone uh, looks at those those parameters differently. Right. But like I said, like I also said, there are people who will who will always. Uh, I mean, it's it's about uh, opportunity. You know, uh, you if you meet someone and there's an opportunity to help them, and you know, you, you can you can help them out. Then that that's what business is about. Right. So uh, yeah. No, please come to me. Please come to me. No, so. so, so when when we were starting out, uh, there were some companies who were ready to take a bet on us. Right, right. You know, yeah. and I, I think, think that, that itself that that gives you some revenue, but also the fact that someone is even willing to spend ten rupees on you right, is a right. is a vote of confidence that you know you if you can get twenty people to do that, you have so much more money. Right now, how do you get twenty people to do it? That's the tough part. That's very yeah. tough, uh, right? But at least you know if five people are ready to do it those five people are not foolish and neither are you right so you so then it's about how good you are at discovering those additional 200 people if you're not very good at it uh, you might still be able to do something but you might not be able to do it at a very large scale very you know? true. but that's about your ability to you know build a business that's not about how you, how you're trying to build it right so free software doesn't have any role to play there Right, right, right. So I don't, so I don't think you know choosing free software in itself is a handicap at all, because okay. finally, business doesn't depend on your on those sort of choices. You know, mm -hmm. the business depends on your ability to solve people's problem uh, when they want to solve it and at a reasonable price, which works for you and them. Right. So right. the the problem is most of the times we are not free to negotiate the terms at which our problem is solved. Right. Right. Exactly. So when you let's say go to a proprietary software company or a or a company which provides software hosting or something like that, you are not in the position to negotiate the prices mm -hmm. or negotiate the terms of that mm -hmm. business. Right. You just accept it and you pay whatever they charge you. So there's right. no. So that is that is not really a marketplace in the truest sense, mm -hmm. because as a consumer, as a as a customer, you don't have the freedom to negotiate. Yeah, true. Right, yeah. or or you are not able to negotiate. You're not powerful enough to negotiate, mm -hmm. and that is unfair. I would say that is unfair in any marketplace in any industry. Right, 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 right. That is wrong. We should never be a part of that sort of a transaction where we don't have the ability to negotiate. Right. right? So right. so think of everything which is non-technology related. Right. Uh, you know, you you are trying to get some plumbing work done, or you're going to get some masonry work done, or you're getting some electrical work done, or anything else. You're getting a car serviced, or vehicle serviced, or something like that, or you choose a school for your child. You negotiate, not because it, you are entitled to negotiate, because but because maybe our estimate of fairness is different from the other person's estimate of fairness. Right, right, right? and right. our negotiation will continue till we both are. Equally dissatisfied or equally satisfied, right? <laughs> so, right. so, so when we reach that balance, in a way, uh, we enter into a transaction. Right. That right. is what that is what business is about. Now, again, you are assuming that uh, it's a free market. Mm. Oh, okay. Yep. And people are choosing to associate freely. Right. There is no there is no unfair terms involved. There is no coercion involved. There is no monopoly. You know, you're assuming all those things. Well, none of those are true. None of those are also true. They're not true. Uh, there are monopolies. There are unfair contracts. There are there is coercion at times. You know, uh, right. there is in there is indirect coercion at times. Sometimes you, know? you have a file format. You have to keep paying. Uh, you know, ransom to a proprietary software company because they don't want to disclose how to interpret that file without that uh, software. You know, so now you are chained to them. You're logged in. So, right. so what? So what I'm trying to say is that free software 
uh, is definitely uh, an enabler in, in my in my personal view it has had a great influence on how i do my business dealings also you know but right. that is not the re that is not the sole reason why someone will do business with me if it's if i'm talking about you know a general organization organizational customer or, or person uh, they will have their own reasons and uh, yeah uh, so like as we're going to, towards the end of our session i i, would, I really want to know if uh, anyone who is who has joined us today would like has a question for abbas right now uh, yeah, you can I can see some questions in the chat. Uh, yeah. Akshay has a question. Hi, Akshay. Great to uh, have you here. Uh, is it? Uh, is it? He's ask. Is it? Uh, is he asking it for someone else in the chat, or is he asking? No, so it? he's asking. Do you wear different caps in, when you're dealing with free okay. software or a, or as a business? Okay. Well, actually, I'm a very bad business person, <laughs> so <laughs> I I can rarely wear two different caps. Uh, right. So a uh, lot of times I do, I, I, I mean, I'm just, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, personally, my goal is to be fair mm -hmm. uh, to myself and, and to, to the other person. And right. uh, uh, the, the ideology, I think the ideology of the free software movement, uh, that it plays a critical role in how you decide to be fair. You know, right. it, I think that that value system plays an important role in product design. It mm -hmm. plays an important role in how you service a product that you sold or a right. service that you sold to someone, mm -hmm. or how you empower them to choose a to choose somebody else and not you for providing a service. You know, right. even that, like for example, if a customer wanted to move their email from something that we have set up to something else, mm -hmm. and they said, "Can you help us migrate?" I, I would help them migrate. I would tell them how to simplify the migration. Right, right. I, I have I have no reason to not help them do that. You would but I also them. know of people who have not helped customers do that. So right. I know I, I I would never. It wouldn't occur to me to make it difficult for someone to do that. Uh, even though that it's a finally they are moving away. You know, I'm not going to get any more business from them. Uh, but it's stupid to think that you know. I mean. They are free to make those decisions. See, now uh, your my duty. In, I feel my duty is to help them make whatever decisions they think are fair and reasonable. And there's nothing wrong in them choosing something else. That's that's right. a part of the game, right? right? So I would not make it any more difficult or, or extra difficult or you know, for them to do that. I would, in fact, go out of my way to make it simpler. Right. You know, right. so there is no lock-in in a way. Uh, one of the major advantages of free software, using free software, is that there is no lock-in, <laughs> uh, and people should be able to choose a service provider. So, right. in that sense, the only lock-in I have with a customer is delight. You know, they are delighted to work with me, or they are delighted to have my company, or they right. feel that I am competent to help them, and and that they feel that I remain competent to help them. Right. You know, right. so so that is about, you know people who work with me and it's it's about how i deal with them and so, uh, deal with the customer and so on right right, right. so uh, we have uh, two other questions by, by darush so first question is how do you price your services and stuff and second question is is it possible to make mainstream and some kind of open network other than the convention network which is restricted and monitored by uh, isp slash government Okay, how do I price stuff? So a lot of times you price stuff based on your estimation of what value people will associate to, to, with that. And everyone associates a different value. For example, I might be willing to go out of my way to pay three times what people would generally pay for a product because that product uh, enables me to use free software uh, in an unprecedented manner. Right. Uh, you know? I can't expect everyone to do that, right, right? Right. So then, when I say three x, that is still dependent on x, right? So what is people's? So so a lot of times it is based pricing is based on your ability to judge someone's uh, how someone is going to perceive the value, right? Right. right? And right. how someone perceives the value is depend is dependent. Uh, well, it, it could actually be unfair how they perceive the value and how they price it, but. Uh, a lot of times you 
overcoat and then you realize what the value what value they really associate you know? or right. it could be based on their affordability uh, sometimes uh, right. or you right. look at what others are charging for it you right. know? so i in my view if a product is 100% free software it, which means the hardware and the software that runs it is free software people should be willing to pay a little bit more for it mm -hmm. uh, because maybe it's not a mass market product uh, you know uh, it, it, it's a niche product so right. well the price would be high but at the same time people maybe people should be willing to pay a little bit more that's that's my opinion uh, that doesn't mean that people are going to pay a little bit more for it right. but right. so you have to experiment uh, most most of the time when i sell hardware for example i'm i'm trying to break even uh, just uh, and charge just enough to cover my expenses and not make that make the price of that product out of everyone's reach mm -hmm. uh, because then my my advocate and activist part kicks in saying if i price it in a, at a level where it's profitable to me no one would use it and right. all those people who i wish would use more free software would not be able to use it what's the point of even thinking about building a product like that right, right. right. so so it's dangerous to mix activism with business you know <laughs> uh, I, I don't have an answer to that. I'm just saying, you know, for in a way, I I, I take those risks when I when I build a lot of solutions. Uh, primarily because my goal is to solve that problem in a in a more elegant manner than it has been solved, or and to do that uh, by also, you know, freeing people in the process of doing it. Uh, right. So uh, the next question: uh, Is it possible to make mainstream uh, some kind of open network other than the conventional network, which is restricted and monitored by ASP? Uh, like, it is definitely possible. Whether yeah. we will do it, so I don't think it's a question of possibility. Right. Technically, it is possible. It is feasible. It's not going to be extra costly to do that, and and so on. Whether we will do it or not is a more important question. I think. Uh, right. uh, all of us choosing or some of us choosing to do it uh, i mean it, it's success or sustainability depends on that uh, right. definitely it's definitely possible to do it and it's not even uh, a huge cost or it's not even something very out of the world right, right that right. that's how i look at it right um, so i uh, some people are typing but uh, so Yes, and we are actually we are actually you know been doing this for more than an hour. So, Abbas, uh, so to ask a question, what would you like to see from the FOSS community that is here in India right now, like for the future? What are things that you would like to see from you know all of us? No, I think that's a wrong question to ask. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't want anything from the community. No, what would you I want? should be asking, what would I want to do? Myself right. as a volunteer, uh, right. see, see, uh, the community does. So we are all again, like I said earlier, we all associate freely together to because we have a shared ideology, we have a shared objective, right. and also because we rarely get to meet people who think like us, and then we find a few people who think like us, and so we 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 get together and we call it yeah. a community right? right so so in my view the first value of that community and sustaining it is that well we should not lose our friendships and you know we, we should continue to have each other to uh, to be there for each other uh, because otherwise we would not be able to talk about these things without having to repeatedly explain ourselves right uh, i think that is that is a lot uh, that itself is a lot, uh, but you know, like one of the things we discussed earlier, you were talking about what you do, uh, the Student Developer Society do I mean, with students. You know, you have organized the debut so earlier. You've organized so many <coughs> events in colleges, right. and I think one of the things you're trying to do is uh, encourage students to be more involved with the community and with free software. Exactly. Yeah. I think what I think what we can do as a community are what those who are who are able to reach out to students in colleges should do is to really you know explain what hacker culture is about exactly. and one of the things that one of the most important things uh, it is about is also doing things ourselves if we don't do things ourselves 
free software will rarely find a place in our in our universe in, in our perspectives right yes. because we can outsource everything in our lives and we it's do it yourself is a matter of principle it's a value system right and right, right. if my value system is i will build all the hardware that i use i will build all the furniture that i use that value system i mean you might end up having a lot of broken and loose furniture but you have built it yourself you have that right. pride right. and if you are that sort of person selling a hackable system to you will be very easy right right, right. right. so right. so so look at the contrary of what we were discussing you know so if so how do we do things ourselves if we don't know how to do things right so well if you can't learn to do things by looking at a black box a black box is nothing to teach you right yeah. so if you wanted to become good at things at doing things you would have to use things which are not black box right which yeah. means things which are free software right right right, right? and and which are inherently hackable by definition right that is right. one thing right once you are able to only access those things you can build skills now you're not scared to do things right and then the concept of doing things yourself uh, can creep in because now you're capable of doing things you right. can seek you can depend upon an ideology where the most critical uh, uh, value system is sharing information right so there is nothing that stops you from doing something right so so then we have to normalize doing things ourselves right because you know again as we discussed earlier the value we we are not going to then otherwise benefit from the freedom of uh, or whatever we are using unless we are doing things ourselves and doing them with free software it's easy to do things yourself with proprietary software also right. so we don't have to get into that trap because proprietary software will not let you build skill it's not really free you it will not it will not help you in in the most ways that we we look at it so you build skills using free software you acquire the ability to do things yourself and then you make do it doing things yourself an important part of your life right and and then when you do things you will want to share what you have done because you you might be proud of it right so right. Uh, even a small even a small 7 year 7 year old uh, kid when they do a drawing that they really like that they really like they want to show it to everyone right, right. so right. Uh, so anyone who does something and they are proud of doing it they will want to share it and you know then you share the source code you share information you share access to information you share you enable others to do what you have done and i think that's that's how communities get built and that's how uh, you know the, the free software community came into uh, being as well right so right. it's not just that i am good at doing things i do it for myself and i don't share it with others yes you know that is also possible uh, but we share not because we are you know trying to boast but because sharing what i have done no matter how bad it is uh, is a way for me to learn as well and it's a feedback loop right linus torvalds share is kernel because not because it was the perfect most perfect kernel that he would have wanted to develop but well he want see if he did not share it he wouldn't have learned to make a better right. kernel right? so so you know as a community we those are things that we can all all of us can do and lead by example so that we can inspire and motivate and guide others who who right. might not have that awareness and if we are able to work with students and even younger people teenagers i think that age maybe 10 12 13 years and you know, onwards uh if we can impress upon them the value of being a hacker hmm. uh truly where everything you do is you you know is, is using free software you build it yourself you give them the pride of building things themselves it could be electronics it could be software it could be whatever it is you, and then you show them how to share that information without using social networks now, how do you build a website you know how do you write about it you know and, and so on uh, maybe they will they will uh, go out uh, or grow up and uh, maybe they will remain uh, you know hackers all their life but right. there are a lot of challenges to even people discovering these things see we are all uh, fairly aware we have the resources to access internet or uh, we all maybe most of us speak english 
and uh, maybe no one restricts us from accessing internet or information or learning things but there might be so many people who have this itch but yes. who don't who whom we can't know or who can't know how we work or how our community works and that is our loss because then you know we are, we are not able to have them and their passion here you know so our outreach is not just should not just be to those who are easier to access for us right you know and people people who are already fairly uh, uh capable of you know discovering and uh, doing of course we should definitely support those but uh i'm saying the the the, the challenge of creating a true culture of hacking of doing things ourselves of relying on things which only free us uh, that that the job and responsibility is much much bigger than just the small influence that we have as individuals right. or as a community so uh, we have more questions uh, and we are actually out of time but like let's just uh, answer all these questions so uh, first one is I, so i don't have a problem spending more time <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, and i'm not going to bill anyone for this so anyway right. i'm just saying uh, if you want to hang around and talk so you know darvesh has put in a good uh, point their workshop on server deployment maintenance i think we should do that uh, yeah, we, can have, uh, we can have a lot of uh, you know such uh, discussions where <clears throat> we build hardware also uh, it's right. not that uh, so when i'm doing going to do things at home i also want to control my lights and i want to do presence management and i want to know the temperature of my fridge maybe right, right? so i right. i do those things actually i the first things i break are at home <laughs> so all the lights in my home are controlled via home assistant via wifi switches which uh, run free software right right and so on so i'm so well there are so many things that uh, we can build like that and uh, i have a nas at home i all my computers obviously run uh, debian or something like that uh, yes we can build keyboards as well right. so i i think uh, this could be a good thing and uh, Uh, we could uh, uh, we could uh, take these uh, some of these workshops to you know students uh, totally, even, totally. when i say students i'm not just talking about engineering college students i i don't believe that they are the best audience <laughs> uh, always uh, you have to look i mean i i don't think that should be the barrier to entry uh, that right. you are yet going to engineering college or that that you even finish school Uh, right. i don't think uh, i think students today or children today in fact teenagers have a lot of have too much time on their hands uh, that right. could be put to better use and uh, one way to engage them is tell them look uh, so you know i had this concept once when i was doing uh, uh, when i was sort of uh, working with uh, students in my office i said look if you want i'll i'll give you a table or a small corner of a room if you want power there you have to wiring do the wiring yourself if you want network you have to do the cabling if you want a computer you have to assemble it you have to install the os yourself and the point was to start at zero you know and and to to put in a large you know increasingly complex more complex handicap uh, as they learn to do things right so you know a lot of us might be scared to touch a wire or put our hand inside a computer or we might not have got the freedom to open a computer up right right now if you can give people a safe environment where they can do these things under your guidance and you know they don't do something very bad and you help them also there but their their confidence in doing such things will only increase see if we are always scared to do something we will hardly ever seek opportunities which help us learn something new right? right so then you will will be scared to run servers at home people will be scared to run free software on a device they'll be scared to buy a device which has to be assembled where you know you get your gratification not the day the courier arrives but two weeks after that right so right. that gratification is being delayed by two weeks but then the catalyst to having it at all is to put in your efforts into it right because what, so the, the, my my point is what is why how do you call something yours just because you paid for it right yes that is one way to one way to do that but everyone can do that right yeah, it's not truly yours even some products 
So if you built it yourself, your right. sense of ownership is greater. I mean, even if it is not perfect, but your sense of ownership is greater, isn't it? Right. So, so my point is that I think we should, when we talk about ownership, when we talk about uh, pride in something we have, it, it makes more sense to have pride in something you built yourself. Or right. Let's say I compiled my kernel, right? <laughs> in a way, I should have pride in that binary because right. I compiled it. Exactly. I, I yeah. should have greater pride. You know, just downloading that kernel and using it is something all of us do, right? So, so it's it's like that. It's like right. that. And 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 when we talk about innovation, when we talk about doing something creatively, a lot of times that creativity creeps in because we are doing something. You're compiling something, or you are assembling something, and you notice there is something that you could have done better, or you come up with a way of doing it better, right? It could be in software or hardware, and and then you do it. Right. Or 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 you break something while doing it, and then you do it again, right? So and then you share it. So right. so that process of adding value to things also comes comes up only because you are doing something, you know. Right. Right. And and even if you have something which is partially working, you still have pride in it because then maybe it's a reminder of an unfinished project or an imperfect outcome, but you can attempt perfection again you know there yep. is no sort of you don't get only one try no that's how usually you learn things like maybe your first installation didn't go well and you hit it again and that's how you get better at it um, going back to the questions uh, so we have a question uh, which phone do you use how do you guarantee you're okay. not tapped via pegasus or any other kind of future malware okay so one thing is i i'm using an asus phone right now uh, I only I'm running Lineage OS on it. I don't have any proprietary software on it, and I don't use any proprietary services on it either. Right. So right. the only people I talk to on it are uh, I talk to them over Signal or Matrix. Mm -hmm. So number one, I blindly trust anyone who talks to me over Matrix because they're not <laughs> going to <laughs> try to harm me. Okay. <laughs> Uh, again, most people who I talk to over Signal, they are people I've had to sort of motivate to get out of other other systems, and so uh, uh, well, so well, I was joking, but I again guarantee the fact that you're using free software or something is no guarantee that someone can can tap you or crack your phone. You you have to be vigilant, I think. But I, I really do feel, without really having facts at my disposal, I really do feel that if you don't use proprietary software or, or networks, the chances of getting tabbed are going to be far less. more remote. Uh, there might be less also. Uh, you don't know. But uh, I think that uh, people who get affected by these things might not uh, believe us when we say, look, uh, free software is that magic pill. You eat that, and then you know you can opt out of all these problems uh, it may or may not be true but i i have a feeling that at least it will you're much better off uh, with that uh, it, it's but how many of us have how i mean i've had my servers cracked because they were vulnerable mm -hmm. right but not because they were running proprietary software right. So, and it's, it's sort of funny because like uh, even when like we have so i've seen webinars where like you know security experts come in and they, they, they'll be talking about you know like protecting the final self journalists and stuff but and then they'll like they, they'll suggest gmail uh, gmail is run by google who has a history of complying with everything nsa and those people say and and these are things said by like experts of of the industry yeah. and and i think it's very misleading and it's, it's also been kind of funny <laughs> to be honest and it's also very sad. See, if you are if you are in a position where you can give that sort of advice to people, yeah, right. and I feel bad that they're not giving advice about free software to them. Right, right. I, I feel bad about that. Uh, so you know, again, Subin says, "What about lineage OS having vulnerabilities?" So I, I'm sure there might be vulnerabilities. I'm sure I have not upgraded my OS every time there is an update available. Uh, uh, well, I don't do that on my laptop either, right? I just I don't just upgrade. I don't just do a disk upgrade because there is an update available, right? Or I don't even upgrade Moodle just because Moodle tells me, look, you, there is a vulnerable security vulnerability in the version that I'm using. Uh, 
so again free software is no guarantee that you can't be cracked i'm not saying that That's right. Yeah. But at least you have the ability to choose something which is more secure if you wanted to. So I'm right. lazy. I don't upgrade Moodle. One day maybe it will get cracked. That mm -hmm. is, I mean, I'm aware of that. Right. And I, if when when it happens or if it happens, I'm not going to blame anyone. An educated <laughs> risk. I'm going to. I'm, no, it's not a risk. I mean, it's a foolish thing. It's, <laughs> I'm being foolish actually. It's not a risk. Uh, one should not be foolish like that. But. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, my my responsibility to myself should say that look, don't do that. It's it's right. dangerous. But uh, yeah, you need to have. Uh, well, maybe you don't have enough time, but uh, at least you have the ability to uh, make those choices. See, that's that's the prime thing. Uh, if you were using proprietary software, you wouldn't have the ability to make that choice. That's the only thing. So, uh, Darush also had asked an earlier question. Uh, any suggestions to marketplaces which uh, I could find cheap second hand old server stuff? Uh, I think it's about you know sourcing hardware that's you know. Uh, that you can, uh, Actually, I just had a conversation with someone last week. They have around 400 servers with them, oh. and they bought them as scrap. <laughs> And they have no idea about how to price them and what they are useful for. Right. I mean, they want to assemble them and they want to sell them. And uh, anyway, I was fortunate to talk to them. And my uh, request to them was, if you give me a quote for this configuration, and uh, I mean, they bought it as scrap. Mm -hmm. So they have to mix and match parts to make a working thing. But anyway, I said, you give me a price, and I will try to pitch it to people in our community and see if they want to buy it. But if you wanted a server with the 64 GB RAM and you know mm -hmm. 12 cores and 5 TB 10K RPM hard drives, oh. uh, I don't know the price. That's my only problem yet. But uh, my my goal is to buy buy that uh, those boxes mm -hmm. and to test them out and ensure they are working, and then you know we can give it out or sell them to people here mm -hmm. and elsewhere uh, so that i mean then i you know i talked to a ups personnel so i said look we're going to sell servers to people how do you sell a server without selling a ups no one will use it they will not even put it on <laughs> so i said we have to give a ups also so i want to bundle a ups and a server and then they also have these storage boxes and so people there are people who have a lot of scrap like that they buy it because they think they can sell it, but I, I'm trying to uh, see if we can at least have few units, 10, 15 good units at a good price. Right. right. And uh, but that is not that will be a power con power hog uh, definitely. Uh, ideally, I I don't run. I mean, uh, I, I run my home server on a single board computer. Mm -hmm. uh, that. Uh, Consumes less power uh, and uh, it's quieter also. Right, right. right. So I uh, think we don't have any more questions. Oh, uh, out of personal interest, uh, where do you source your ThinkPads from? <laughs> oh, I have uh, three people in Bangalore who right. uh, who used to buy these in bulk, uh, hmm. who would import them also. In fact. So co co corporates go through this uh, IT cycle every few years, yeah, right, and right. Uh, so that's why they just dump all their corporate laptops. And right, right. a lot of times, when you get those models, they're in really good condition. They look like they've not been even used. Uh, but a lot of these units used to get imported. Uh, so till last year, you know, supply would always be there. Now, mm -hmm. after COVID and a lot of these import restrictions. Uh, supply supply has come down. Mm -hmm. uh, I find it very difficult to source now. But uh, the moment they have stock, they tell me. So, you, I mean, I have experimented with a lot of people. I have taken a lot of risk to discover people I can rely on. I, I would right. put it like that. So, right, right. All right. Uh, yeah. So, any suggestion, single board PC other than uh, RSPI, uh, RSPI? Uh, there is uh, Udu, U D O O Udu. Uh, they have Intel-based uh, single-board computers, so Celeron right. and uh, Pentium. 
Uh, right. There is also a board called UpSquared if you want Intel. Uh, there are a lot of Intel based or x86 based boards, I would say. There is a, a single board computer called APU by, by a Swiss company called PC Engines. <laughs> and uh, that board has two, three, or four network cards, so you can even use it as a firewall. Right. Okay. And it has the CPU soldered onto it, uh, 2 GB or 4 GB RAM. So it's not very powerful, but it can definitely be a good firewall and home server. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, so like I said, these other boards that I told you about, the Uru board and UpSquared. So these are uh, these are good x 6 based boards. Uh, I also run Odroid at home, Odroid XU4, which is a very powerful uh, single board computer. My NAS runs, uh, uh, my NAS is built on a board called the uh, Helios 4. Uh, Helios, H E L I O S. And uh, that has a, well, it has a um, dual core ARM thing. So, Raspberry Pi, I don't use for the simple reason that, uh, well, I, I, I needed to put in a disk. Uh, I mean, I, I use a Raspberry Pi with my television uh, as a co for, for Kodi. And right. That has been running for about five years now. Uh, but uh, so you can use a Raspberry Pi. Uh, in fact, today there are Raspberry Pi four based boards which have SATA and uh, NVMe slots and, and so on. Uh, you can even uh, so they are they are built around the compute module. So, mm -hmm. so, so using the compute module, people have built a lot of these boards. Right, right. And uh, uh, those are good starting points. Of course, you don't have any of those available in India, so you have to start uh, right. import those. But yeah, I think they are yeah. good. What laptop do you use? I actually I'm using two right now. I use an X two thirty and X two twenty both. Right. Uh, good ones. <laughs> right. Uh, so. So like uh, there are so I, in that respect I'd like to ask you question. So like uh, the laptops like Librem and uh, so they're they're the one and they're trying to you know like play within the playground as in like they're trying to uh, they're you know tinkering with the management engine and they're trying to do that. And there are other people on the other spectrum who are trying things outside this whole sphere as in like probably ARM chips and this thing. So like what are your views on all these products? No, I think uh, these are excellent products, and uh, if you can buy them, you should. Right. Uh, they yeah. will be. I I think they will be repairable. I, I right. hope they will be repairable. One thing I like about ThinkPads is that at least the old models, the ones that I use, are very repairable. Very much, yeah. And uh, I have not faced a situation where I haven't been able to repair something. So, right. so. But that is that that and that that repairability quotient is not accidental. I think that's a mark of a of good design, good hardware design. Right. right. But uh, so well, I, I think uh, Librem or even uh, System seventy six and these these sort of models which give you a modern CPU. See the the ThinkPads that I use are very old. Right. Uh, so if you are doing something uh, very complex, then you will not want to use them. Right. 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 Uh, in that case, I feel you are better off using a desktop. Right. Uh, you should right. not uh, bother with a laptop as well because I, I, I personally, I can't use any of those laptops because the keyboards are just like. Yeah. And, I understand. So uh, you know, I, 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 even if I'm using a laptop, I have a mechanical keyboard. Uh, so this is what I'm using right now on my computer. Right. Show you. This is. Well, I'm excited about the keyboards. And, uh, and this is a wooden case, actually. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I cannot use a lap. Most of the times, I can't use a laptop uh, keyboard. <laughs> so I disable it. I put this keyboard on top of it, and right. I use that. Right, right. Uh, do we want to know more about uh, your keyboards and you know, like, what do you offer? Probably. So, like, please talk more about that. So I started, you know, uh, working with keyboards in uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about five, six years back. And uh, uh, well, one go one reason was to 
experiment with mechanical keyboards, but then I realized that they're all hackable and I could reprogram them. And that, in a way, that opened up a lot more uh, uh, interesting opportunities with what I could do. And so I played a lot with uh, layouts. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have an Atreus, maybe I could show you. Yeah, please, please. So this is an Atreus. Uh, it's an ortholinear mini keyboard. Again, this is MDF. Uh, it's very lightweight, it's something okay. you can carry around in your bag. Uh, this was one of the first keyboards I assembled. I bought it directly from the uh, developer. And uh, he, uh, so he used to sell these kits. And uh, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, mechanical keyboards that you can reprogram and hack on, they really, in a way, that was a these the keyboards were the gateway hardware products to doing more hardware hacking. And right, right. Uh, I, I I would say that if once you get to once you can accept that all my keyboards are you know programmable and I can build them myself and I can maintain them myself and you know they're easy to repair and so on. Uh, you can extrapolate from there and basically take that value system to every, every piece of hardware, hardware you use. So it could be a it could be a wireless switch, it could be a computer, it could be a small IoT thing, it could be an oscilloscope, uh, it could be a wireless router. Yes, so right. so uh, well. Uh, it could be a 3D printer as well. So uh, my, my point is that uh, I, in a way, once I started experimenting with key keyboards, I grew to expect that every piece of hardware that I would use would right. be equally hackable. And then I started fabricating my own hardware and also keyboards. So, uh, so this is one model. And there is one, I think I posted pictures about this. So this this thing is very heavy, actually. Uh, but all of this is manufactured in Bangalore. Uh, mm -hmm. There is there is a stainless steel case, and uh, there is this PCB. So so these are all the PCBs, you know. Right. right. I I got these PCBs made. Right. And. Uh, so my attempt was to be able to still build keyboards without having to import these parts. Right, right. That was the only goal because I have not been able to build any keyboards for almost uh, since 2019, I think, because I have not been able to import any parts after after that. And uh, well, I thought if I could build everything here, at least most of the things, then the things I would have to import would be less, and mm -hmm. uh, then uh, more people could use these. Right, right, right. Uh, so maybe so one thing you might have noticed that this keyboard for example has a wrist rest right? mm -hmm. and uh, when I design this case also so I mean I didn't design it fully but uh, when I when I build this case I put in a wrist rest there as well right, so right. it is about the same size this is about the same size as the bottom part of my laptop mm -hmm. and this wrist rest is also about the same size uh, and I feel the wrist stress is very important because uh, otherwise I would have a lot of uh, pain in my wrist. But you can do such things. See, if you were, if you had a better three D printer, you could have even, I, you know, printed this case out. I, I tried that out, but uh, my my three D printer cannot uh, print a very large plate, so I had to print it out in two halves, and then try to stick it together. And uh, I made a mistake in how I uh, cut it. So they did not fit together. <laughs> so, well, that, that is wasted. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is that uh, I think, th so the laptops have better agronomics sometimes because they have a, they have a wrist rest for you. Yeah, and yeah. I personally cannot use a keyboard unless I put in an external wrist rest or I have it built in. Built in, the advantage is that you can put it on your lap and you will still have that same uh, comfort. Uh, right. your, Akash is asking about routers. I, I use TP-Link uh, routers. Uh, I'll show you one router here. Uh, so this is, I, I have uh, many of these at home right now. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to build a, a Libre mesh with these. 
so these these routers actually support uh, mesh networking they are advertised with that and uh, so i have two goals uh, one is to be able to sell these with open wrt preloaded on them mm -hmm. so if people are scared to do that or they don't want to do it themselves they can get a pre flashed open wrt with the router right uh, i have a friend nishant uh, he runs a company called unmukti and they actually their full time uh, focus as a business is to build such products so they have multiple uh, hardware models for routers wireless routers you know, very powerful firewalls all running pre software right? right. so they they help other businesses uh, 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 implement networks uh, using 100 percent free software right. so that's what i use so uh, i have uh, three four of these in my house so if, uh, we actually have quite a bit of questions so like let me go from the oldest one so when is the keyboard coming on mostly harmless store i think it's about to make i i have to figure out uh, two things uh, with regards to the production uh, right. So, so those like the case is not complete really. Uh, yeah. There are two plates, but between them there is nothing. <laughs> so I have to put some acrylic spacers, and I'm I have to do that. Is so there are small things like that. In yeah. fact, I could paste a link if you are interested in my in, in the current state of the keyboard. Uh, there is a recent post that I did, and if you go to that link, uh, you can read up on the current uh, state. Of, right. of the keyboards, and I've listed out what is what I'm working on now. Uh, I'm still having to import keycaps. Keycaps are the biggest uh, cost, actually. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you want a keycap which doesn't have a Windows key, you want a set like that which doesn't have a key which has the Windows logo or Win on it. I mean, you can get those fairly cheap, like maybe twenty-five, thirty dollars. But if you want a better quality key set which doesn't have Windows or which has maybe code written on it or hack or super or something like that, well, it's a small nuance, but then those cost a, a lot more and they right. still have to be imported. And the problem with imports is that you end up paying a lot of duties yeah, yeah. as yeah. much as 40%. 40, 40%. So, so that is a challenge for me. Uh, and well, I don't have orders yet. <laughs> so if I import it, then uh, uh I, I don't know if they will sell yet but anyways so so uh, yeah more questions um so uh, so i'm not sure if you're aware of this there's this company called framework and they produced a modular laptop with yeah. modules that you can take in and take out so like uh, we want to know your opinion on that maybe it's a good thing i i did have a look i i so I mean, obviously, so they're trying, I feel they're trying to focus on two areas. One is make it easy for people to customize these laptops and right. extend them and also extend the life of these laptops by making at least some of the parts uh, replaceable easily. It's basically right. like what the fair phone were trying to do uh, uh, yeah. by making a modular phone with, uh, with parts that you can replace by, and also by selling those spares. So it's a definitely a good move. Uh, um, I wish it had. I mean, they. I was reading their forums. They were trying to. They are using. Uh, they are using the Chromium embedded controller EC firmware. Uh, mm -hmm. So they they can release the source code for it because that upstream project has. Uh, so all the Chromebooks use that same embedded controller EC, and uh, they've used that fortunately, so they can release that. Uh, in fact. Uh, one of the problems with Librem was that even though their BIOS and everything else was free software, their embedded controller was not. Right. And the the problem with the embedded controller is that is what controls your keyboard layout <laughs> and power management. So you cannot customize your keyboard layout on the laptop because it's hardwired by the embedded controller firmware. Yep. And uh, theoretically, Chromebooks should be more hackable for two reasons. They use core boot and they use the Chromium uh, EC firmware, which is uh, free software. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a Chromebook, but I have not been able to uh, you know, customize the key map on it yet. Right. Uh, but my other complaint with framework would be the keyboard. <laughs> 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 I wish they did not use these island keys. 
right. like on my X230, I have an X220 keyboard for the simple reason that that keyboard has better tactile feel, right? Mm -hmm. the, the older keyboards had the bigger keycaps and uh, better feel, and uh, the, now they use these island style keys, right? So uh, personally, I don't, I don't like that, uh, and uh, I wish you no know, people could go back to using those older type of scissor keys. You know. I feel you. I feel you. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, Darush wants to know if we can have a room or lab tour at some point. Pardon? Uh, so, like here. So he's asking if you can, you know, at some point give uh, give us, you know, maybe now. I'm not sure if it's possible now, but like maybe in a video you can upload in your peer trip instance a tour of your workshop, your lab, the way uh, the place you work. You know. I would be very embarrassed doing it right now because there's too much junk around. <laughs> I, 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 but, uh, well, I have, I could show you some parts of it, which are not right. that embarrassing. So I have this component uh, rack here. So I, where I keep all the spares and my hardware components. Right, right. But basically I have just boxes and boxes of stuff. Uh, right. you know, it's not organized really. That's the problem. Right, uh, right. So if I, if I organize it, then I would be, Happier <laughs> giving you <laughs> a tour, cool. but uh, I typically buy a lot of help. But for example, this is something that I built. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see it well. Okay, let me switch off the light. Now you can see this, right? Right. Uh, it is basically something I 3D printed, and yes. it's using a transparent filament and a small LED ring in it. Right. Right. Now right. on the back side, you actually have something called a. Uh, we, uh, it, it's basically had a ESP has an ESP eight to six x this right. You can see that. Right. Uh, right. Now what you can do with this is you can uh, make these lights react to sound, for example, or you can have other effects on this. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I can yeah, you can see. It. Okay, let me switch up the light. For them. So you can see the uh, you can see the color transitions. Right, right. Yes, we can. Right, right. So, well, there are hundreds of these, but what I was trying to experiment with, uh, so this is a more, uh, you know, what is called, you might say, call it a consumer product. Right, right. right? right. Uh, the idea was to make simple things like this and make them look good uh, and not uh, too bad uh, and uh, make them use useful, right? Right, right. So, so that is an attempt. Uh, now, this uh, microcontroller runs a firmware called WLED, right. and uh, you can. Con I mean, the firmware is free software. You can connect it to. You can you can connect it to another tool called LEDFX, which can awesome. take your pulse audio output or your mic output and uh, you know react to it. That's awesome. So, so that is. So well, my point was that uh, it's easy to do these things and they also look good. Now this is something. Uh, this is a small macro pad. It's a small keyboard uh, that my daughter uses for her online classes to do various things in the tool. So the, this is the volume control, and then these are buttons which uh, have macros mapped to them. So right now it's configured for big blue button. Okay. So I can close open the chat and uh, also mute and mute myself, enable, disable. I, I mean, I can reprogram it with whatever shortcuts that I want. That's, that's, uh, that's so, really useful, especially nowadays when you have to do a lot of mute and unmute. No, I think it's very useful for children because if they have to, can you imagine pressing Control Alt C? <laughs> right, you know, right. Can't do that. A kid can't. Do that, and they shouldn't have to do that. And right. sometimes, uh, you know, these proprietary tools also have very obscure key key uh, key maps. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in a way, the fact that we can build these things and they are powered by free software firmware, uh, right. uh, we can actually solve these problems more elegantly for people and especially children. Right. So, right. Uh, if you want, I can show you other. Prototype. So I had built many prototypes before uh, this one. So this is a smaller one, mm. uh, and uh, this is yet another one. Mm. The idea. Well, I'm not really playing around the number of switches in it, but 
it's my focus is on packaging it to, right. uh, to be more reliable and easier to assemble and service right. all, all these things so right. if i want to repair it or if i want to uh, reprogram it or something it should not be tough to do that uh, which right. is why i'm trying to design a pcb for it now in fact if there is anyone who wants to design who knows how to design pcbs or knows how to use open scad uh, I would love to work with you to design and release a lot of these designs. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to learn, but I'm I mean it's taking too much time to learn these things, mm -hmm. and I'm using stuff which I can get from others, which others have built and shared. Uh, but that's always imperfect, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I know what I want to fix in the design, but I don't know how to do it. Right, right. So if so. And a lot of people who even release the source code for the design, they have released that in proprietary formats. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. So uh, if someone knows how to use OpenSCAD or KeyCAD, and these are two very scriptable tools, you know, you don't have to design the PCB by hand. It's like uh, you can use, you can write a program to to generate the PCB, and then you do the finishing touches by hand. Uh, we can actually solve build so many more small products like that and right the cost will go down uh, reliability will go up because we are um, uh, because how we build them basically makes sense um, so uh, one uh, so k wants to know about your diy ideology outside computers and hardware like real life applications like choice of vehicles and as such so I uh, well uh, I decide I mostly assemble my own furniture as well, uh -huh. and uh, I buy kits. Uh, so right. I'm not really doing too much. I'm following instructions and basically right. putting things together. But uh, that teaches me something about how to make stuff that can be assembled by others, for example, right. and how to communicate how to assemble it. But more importantly, you know, I'm trying to also communicate, build that value system for my daughter, so that mm. the notion that we grow up with should not be that we want something, we'll get it and we'll use it. Just have that sort of consumerist mindset. Right. Right. I mean, when we were growing up, almost everything was repairable. Today, mm -hmm. everything has software in it. If it is electronics, if it's a pro electronics product, has software in it, and hence. If that software is proprietary software, you cannot repair that hardware. But there's nothing to repair because it's a double black box. There is a black box which is the software, and there's a black box which is the hardware. Uh, so the only way to and my point is tomorrow, if a kid says, "Look, I want to know how this works," I don't want to have to tell them that. Look, it's a black box. I can't tell you. So I don't want to be surrounded by black boxes uh, because then I would not be able to, uh, you know, explain how things work to someone else. That is one thing. Second thing is, uh, uh, like I said earlier, there is no pride in that. Mm -hmm. So, so I have personally been trying to do more things myself uh, uh, because. So I learned a bit of uh, woodworking as well, so that I could. I was trying to design wrist rest for keyboards, and I was trying to do you know stupid experiments like that uh, cut acrylic to make a case for single board computers so we built a cluster which had some i think it had some 20 single board computers and i didn't know how to build a build a chassis for it how do you put 20 single board computers together and make it portable right and then how do you put disks on it right. and then how do you put power supply and networking so well i used acrylic and i built that and I, uh, I feel good that I, I did all of it myself. Right. Uh, but uh, cutting aluminum rods or ac acrylic sheets, uh, well, those are things I did to support a computing endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I mean, my 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 philosophy is that, that if I should be able to do something for myself. Uh, not just because I will do it better than what others would do it, but because I want to understand the process of doing it, and I want to also uh, have the ability to repair it in extended future. Very much. Like I agree to that on a lot of levels. Uh, 
So uh, yeah, Atul wants to know which layout do you prefer, ortho or stagger or split uh, keyboards? No, I can't use uh, ortho linear. I mean, I can't use because I haven't had the patience to uh, reprogram the muscle memory. Uh, I would say, if if you do that, if you practice well enough, uh, you you will be able to get the hang of it. Right. Uh, right. I did not see a significant. Uh, so you know your productivity drops the moment you start doing that, and then you get irritated that you're not able to do what you need. What's, <laughs> what's on your mind? Your hands are not able to translate that command that you want to type. So I, I used to use this Atreus keyboard uh, for writing uh, mm -hmm. because then I'm not when I'm not typing commands or something. I don't need too many of those things, and I I, could, I found it more comfortable to to use ortholinear layouts for writing, but. Uh, Finally, it's about having the patience to persist with that process, mm -hmm. uh, to unlearn some of your bad typing habits, and to you know basically learn. Right. Uh, so another question: Are you planning to on selling PCBs for 68 key keyboards? I said yes to that. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, you answered that. My All question right. is: My problem is I could sell you the PCB, but that's not. Uh, what would you do with that? <laughs> you would need to assemble. There, there's no components on that. So I selected this design because everything is a through hole part, and I can buy those parts and assemble the keyboard myself. Right. Uh, so you would have to put the diodes and the resistors and the switches, and then you'll have to find a case for it. So I, I can, if you want, I can send you all these things in a kit so that you can assemble it yourself. Uh, you, know, like I mean, hacker, you can try you know, selling that like that first. I think a lot of people would like that. Yeah, I, I've done that in the past. When I've sold keyboards, I've encouraged them to come to office and you know spend a couple of hours building it there rather yeah. than me building it for them. Again, so that they don't think of that as a black box that somebody built and gave it to them. I mean, they could have then bought a proprietary keyboard as well, right? right. So. Right. Again, uh, by helping them build it themselves uh, and guiding them so that they don't make mistakes and also you know, it works well, it achieved both the goals of having pride and also having the skill to maintain it and to fix it if something breaks. Right. Right. So then they don't have to. I don't have to sell self support for it. Right. Right. <laughs> so because I can then help them fix it. Uh, right. I think at some point, you know, we'll invite you to Caroline, you know, you can help us build our own mechanical keyboards, maybe a workshop or something one day like that. Sure. Uh, why not? In fact, what we can do is we can have a lot of kits which are which have such small keyboards on it. Right. So that uh, if you do a workshop, then uh, it would uh, uh, not take too much time to, to uh, assemble. The cost would also be low. Right, right. And uh, you know, uh, but but what you learn is representative of uh, what you need to learn. So you can easily, if you could do this five keys thing, you could do hundred keys or sixty keys. Right, uh, right. Because the, the firmware would remain the same. The method of customizing the key map remains the same. Uh, the uh, the whole process of building it remains the same. Right. So uh, th this is a good learning uh, platform that way. Right. Uh, so, is it possible to have an office tour as well after course? Uh, have a meetup. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Uh, most welcome. Right. Uh, most welcome. Great. All right. Uh, more people are typing. Uh, I'm not sure if the questions will come now. Uh, but yeah, let's just wait. Maybe. <laughs> right. Um. I will see. Right. More keyboards. So uh, I guess uh, that's it. Uh, I'm not getting so like nobody's typing. Well, uh, so Abbas, uh, thanks for type us. my email address here. You can mail right, me right. or So, uh, Libra Tech Shop. Uh, maybe Abbas, you also want to leave links to your uh, shop, online shop. Yeah. So this is uh, and uh, 
mostly harmless also i guess uh, let, me, let me put that down so this is the documentation for all this stuff and this is the forum what i had shared earlier so we mm. can actually have more discussions around self hosting or choosing hard hackable hardware there i mean that was the whole idea behind the forum to uh, encourage people i mean to give people a avenue where people can discuss these things and uh, can seek recommendations on uh, on you know, what hardware to purchase a lot of times there is a lot of guesswork involved uh, so uh, if they could get reliable advice then they could uh, the, the the guesswork gets removed and uh, uh, people can have more confidence in their purchase you know they don't have to fear that the money will get wasted so uh, i think uh, uh, that that was the whole idea behind the, the discourse forum and uh, again it's like i said earlier we normalize using such things uh, more people will use it uh, so we assume that everyone in the community has the potential to influence 10 people we all have to lead by example very true very and, true and uh, if if more people see more of us doing these things uh, at least at least few of them will want to replicate it or ask about it and that is especially true for children and students uh, i feel uh, we have to walk the talk exactly very important yep uh, is abbas thanks for joining us today abbas it's it's been a very very great session and uh, i i'm like everything that i this is the session ended up being everything i thought i'd be when i invited you and i'm really grateful thank you so much thanks everyone for joining thanks everyone for asking questions and uh, we are actually having a small community meet up tomorrow 7 pm and those of you who uh, want to join that and we can uh, discuss more about this session tomorrow and that be great so yeah thanks everyone for joining and uh, so yeah this is thank the end everyone. of everyone thanks everyone all right